The following interview was conducted with Carol McGrew, editor, um, publishing unit of Bank Communications, formerly with the Purdue University Press, until, from 1990 to 2002, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, February 5, 2010, in Stewart Center, 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Carol. Good afternoon to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for okay, having me. Okay, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in the early years. Um, I'm a Lafayette native. I was born in Lafayette, raised here, uh, went to school here. Um, from Where'd you go to grade school? Then? Where uh, grade you? school was split between St. James Lutheran School and Long Life Elementary, which is no longer around, but is now McAllister Center. Um, Sunnyside was my middle school, and, and Jeff High School, I was graduate of Jeff High School. Okay, tell us a little about middle school and, and grade school, any, uh, or high school. Student organizations and uh, any teachers? I, or uh, yeah, a lot of influential teachers. That's probably where I started to develop a love for English and language. Um, mainly, I remember that we were structured different. We were uh, a seventh through ninth grade unit, so we actually spent our freshman year as a in the junior high as opposed to the high school building. Okay. Well, tell us about, uh, any clubs, and then, then tell us about high school. Oh my. Uh, that you can remember. Testing my memory. A um, lot of a lot of music activities. I was very strong in music, okay. uh, and at one time thought I would continue that past high school. So, uh, a lot of musical organizations, choir, orchestra. Sure. So. Okay. Now, now they've got that performing arts center over there. Very nice. Yeah, yes. So very nice. Roman. <laughs> yes. Very nice. <laughs> oh, then what came next? Well, I um, when did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 1979. Okay. Um, I had intended to go to IU. Uh, plans didn't work out. I ended up what I thought was temporarily at Purdue, and uh, turned out to be longer term. So I eventually switched my major and graduated from Purdue with a political science um, okay. what year major. Did you graduate from? Uh, graduated in 1986. Okay, in political science. Okie dokie. Then. Your career path? Did you go well, my school? intent was to go to law school, and I changed my mind basically. Um, and when I did that, I started uh, reevaluating my degree, trying to figure out what I was good at and what I could do, and whether I did need to go on for more school. And I decided to become an editor temporarily, uh, thinking that that would get me through till I decided what I wanted to do. And here I am, 20 plus years later, still editing. So. I must have liked it. <laughs> and it liked you. And I hope right. so. <laughs> okay. Well, then let's talk about the press. And you came, how did it come about that you came to work here? Okay. Um, I started, actually, I started, uh, my first job out of school was with the Ag Communication Service. And I worked as a, a copy editor in their news area. Did that for three years. And at a point when I was starting to look around and, and looking for something new to do, um, I, I heard about the opening through a mutual friend uh, at the press and became very interested in that. Um, had always loved books, loved the idea of producing them and editing and working on them. So um, applied for and, and was fortunate enough to get the job. Okay. And that was in May of 1990 that I started there. Okay. Well, t you take it from there. Uh, some of the things that were involved. With it. Well, when I, when I started the press, uh, started there, I was hired on uh, full time as an editor slash production manager. So I really had two sets of duties. Um, editing, pretty obvious. Uh, you worked with the authors. Um, you copy edited the manuscript. You worked back and forth with them on their changes and, and resolved all of the, the questions and um, prepared the book for eventual printing. Um, as far that also entailed um, being a proofreader at times, the difference being that somebody else had already edited the book and then a different person would review it to make sure that all the editorial changes had been executed properly and that they had, um, uh, that when the books were t being typeset and that is laid out, uh, f taken from a manuscript page into a book layout form, that um, everything ha was laid out appropriately, uh, line breaks, um, page lengths, um, page layouts, um, Hyphenation, a lot of lot of detail work in proofreading. So, so the editorial side of it was editing books uh, in a manuscript state and also proofreading books in a laid out, uh, designed state. 
Is a little is it uh, editing a little bit easier now with the impact technology? Uh, it, so it can be oh. easier. It can be it can be faster at times. Um, editing electronically is something I do now that I did not do then. Sure. Everything was hard copy then. You took the print out, and uh, of course we ended up with stacks and stacks of paper by the time a book was done because at every stage we, we kept track of that until the book had been around in print for a while. Um, so it was a record of, of the changes. So very different today. <laughs> a little, somewhat a little easier, but quite a bit different. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but the other side of my job was uh, to be a production manager and um, actually had a, quite a range of, of uh, responsibilities related to that. Um, I would uh, I did all the print buying for the press, and, and the press was one of the organizations, one of the few places on campus that could do their own print purchasing. And so I would identify the print vendors. Um, I would prepare specifications uh, for obtaining a printing bid, so how many pages were in a book and what sort of materials or paper or trim size of the book. Um, I would have to, to assemble all of those details working with the designer and um, then we would send those to the printer and tell them how many copies we wanted to print and, and of course get bids. We typically got three competitive bids back and um, then based on how well the specifications met our needs, then we could accept the bid, usually the lowest bid of course, and then um, and then get the book printed. Right. So You never used printing services on campus though, did you? They did dust jackets and promotional materials for us, but no, um, they did not print our books. Actually, most of our books and uh, most of our books were printed in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area. It just happens that that is one of the centers, and I know it's changed over the years, but at the time I was printing um, many of the short run book printers were located there. Um, there, of course, were larger printers. There, there were two types of printers, um, that, and we used one of the two. Basically, um, if you were doing small quantities of books, which is mostly what we were doing, uh, 500 copies, 1,000 copies, 2,000 copies, that's considered a short run, and those were done on um, offset presses, sheet-fed presses, and most of that printing industry was located in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area. Um, there were also web presses, and there were a few times we got into web presses with very large runs of our books, but that was unusual. Sure, okay. So, um, but there weren't any uh, short-run book printers located in the state, otherwise I think we, we would have oh, yeah. used them. Um, but we did use uh, state printers for other needs. Um, we used to uh, use printing services, as I said, here on campus. Um, to print uh, dust jackets for the books, promotional materials uh, such as brochure or um, advertising handouts. Um, other printers that we used included locally Lafayette Printing and Haywood Printing, and then um, we also did a lot of work with Krieger Ragsdale in Evansville. Okay. Oh, what about uh, the manuscripts? How did they come in to the press? Um, the manuscripts used to be submitted a variety of ways. Um, uh, m most presses have areas that they become known for. They develop uh, um, either a series or an area of publication that they become known for. And so if you had an author who was publishing in that type of um, in that genre, discipline. in that discipline, then they would, so they would seek you out. Um, I'm sure there were other times where manuscripts were solicited where somebody knew of a good project and, and but that was more of the managing editor's responsibility and or the director's responsibility. So during my tenure that would have been, uh, Margaret Hunt did quite a lot of that, um, as did David Sanders as uh, the press director and Tom Bacher when it was sure. his okay. tenure. Okay, all right. Let's talk a little bit about the facilities and then you talk about series. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the facilities, when I first started uh, in the summer of, of 1990, we actually were located in the basement of uh, South Campus Courts Building D. That was temporary, fortunately. I didn't uh, know they had a basement. They do schools. have a basement, and actually that's where our books were stored. Small quantities of our books were stored for a very long time, and all the order for f fulfillment took place out of there, too. Um, but it, we actually were fortunate. We secured, um, or somebody did for us, secured 
um, South Campus Courts Building B, which was a very small building um, and only held uh, three offices and a um, mail room. And so um, they gave us that because we were a small operation and that's where we resided for quite some time until eventually we moved over to South Campus Courts Building E when we needed more room and, and the university available. had it to give to us, yes. <laughs> yes. So. Okay. Um, Go ahead. But as far as um, uh, the production, it was, I'd say most of my uh, work probably fell under the production side of things. Um, when I started with the press, I was full-time, um, and again, I was, uh, half of my time was spent as the production editor, and actually probably more than half of my time, and then editor the other part, portion of the time. Um, at, after David Sanders joined the press as the director, at some point he decided that I would be good at marketing the books. So he asked me if I would take over the marketing management um, of the books, and so I did. Uh, that switched my duties from editorial to um, spending it half as production manager and half as marketing manager. As the marketing manager, I used to do things uh, to promote the books. This could include anything from um, purchasing advertisement, identifying reviewers, uh, responding to um, uh, commenters who wanted to, to um, review the book for their publication, um, working with exhibits and, and trade um, publications, trying to get the, the word out there about the book, um, responding to media inquiries, which we would occasionally have, and uh, applying for competitions, awards, anything basically that, to get the, the book noticed. Um, used to spend, uh, as I said, half my time doing that and half with the production work. Again, with the production, it was buying the printing, getting everything that needed to be done to get the book ready for printing, working with the designers, working with the printers, reviewing all the proofs that came in um, at Lots each of stage. Paper proofs. Uh, well, the yeah. the paper the proofs were a variety. They were sometimes, um, it, of course, over the years they evolved to become digital, um, but they. Uh, they would. There was a specific kind of proof called a blue that was ex essentially a photographic process, and basically they would create negatives from the files that we sent, and then create those proofs. And then we had to go through looking to make sure that everything was correct, and there, there was the proofs weren't dirty, that the the words were all there, things like that, basic things. Um, and so it was my job to to keep those proofs moving, the whole time that the book was at the printer until we got a, a completed book. Um, in 1995, I believe it was, uh, I, I decided that I would really prefer to be working half-time. Um, had a small child at the time, and uh, David allowed me to split my, my two positions, which the marketing manager and the production manager, into two. I kept the production management, and another uh, half-time marketing person was, was hired to, to fill that position. Mm -hmm. um, I continued as the halftime production editor then until I left the press in 2002. Oh, okay. All right. Do you ever have any uh, errors that slipped through the cracks? Do you ever recall those? I remember one time it seemed like an, uh, an author making a change um, at the, after the first after the book was printed and we had to reprint um, the first signature. I can't tell you now what the change was, sure. but no, once the, the book was in print, we checked and double checked and triple checked and quadruple checked because once the book was in print, you couldn't change it. So, um, you know, costs were always a concern. Um, we were always trying to get the most for our money, stretch our dollar the furthest it would go, and uh, to have something that would need to be changed after it came from the printer would be unheard of, really. Is there any university support for the funding at all, or is it just how, did, how was this, the support for the press? We were paid by the university. Okay. I don't know what the extent of our their sure. commitment to us was. Um, obviously, we got our facilities, um, um, computers. Uh, okay, okay. We had warehousing of our books uh, through the Purdue warehouses out on North 9th Street for a while. Um, so we obviously had support from the university. Sure, okay. Over time, there became more of a shift to try and bring in as you know much support as you could for sure. it to be self-supporting. Sure. I don't know how far that effort was underway when I was leaving. Right. So okay, 
Um, and then, of course, how do you set? Do you, how would they set the prices for the books? Do you have any idea on that? Yes, to oh. some extent. Okay. Um, it, uh, it of course depended on the um, the market, what other books in that area were going for. Um, it would depend on the size of the book. A longer book obviously costs more to produce, and so sure. that might raise the price. Um, if it uh, the printing costs, the marketing costs were all factored in at the very beginning. Um, and so we had budgets for those, and, and so you, ideally uh, you were selling through your first print run to recoup your costs, right. so, and probably even a little less than the full print run to, to recoup your right. costs. Okay. You want to talk about the series? Um, we did several series while I was there, and, if, and those um, changed. Uh, more were added after I left. But some of the ones I remember uh, specifically, uh, there was a, a series called, um, I hope I have it accurate, uh, Purdue University Monographs in Romance Literatures, I believe it's P-U-M-R-L. And those books were produced out of um, uh, Purdue's Foreign Language and Literatures Department. Um, eventually, a, an agreement was was reached between the two that we would, that the Purdue Press would publish that series, and it, it evolved and became the Purdue Studies in Romance Literatures, which is still going on today, as far as I know. Um, the books are still uh, prepared in foreign language and literatures, and then um, and then the production is done by the press, okay. uh, the, the printing, I should say. There was a Balkan and Danubian studies series that I believe now is, is the Central European Studies and um, there were, we had a number of uh, books related to the Habsburg Empire that Purdue became very well known for and and, um, and so we, we published quite President a few. President Grotto was in one that was doing that work, wasn't he? The I'm Hasp sorry? And Grotto was on that? In Grail, yes. In yes, right. yes, yes, he, he was. was doing it. And, and, he, and he was at least, he was our author, I believe we published at least two of his books. Um, but yeah. yes, he was involved he in was that an series. Expert in that area. Yes, yes, sure. he was. Okay. Um, uh, we did the poetry series. Um, it had been going. Po the press had been publishing poetry before I arrived, but uh, of course I arrived right when Verna Emery was retiring, and um, in which was in 1990, and that's when they established the Verna Emery Poetry Competition. And once that was set up, uh, one time a year we would take manuscripts for that submission. They were carefully reviewed, and a winner was selected. And that would be the poetry book that was published by the press that year. Okay. So, and that was continuing, I believe, the whole time I was there, okay. from '90 to 2002. Was there a, a monetary was that with the prize? I believe there was, yeah. but I I'm forget some of the news releases. Are, it didn't. It, I may have missed on that, but I'm not really sure whether they did. I honestly don't remember yeah. that clearly. Yeah, that's uh, right. that's publication nice. definitely was part of the sure, prize sure. Um, to have your book selected and published. Right. Um, we started a history of philosophy series while I was there, and um, that was those books were very interesting from a production standpoint and an editorial standpoint um, because they would have original texts on one side of the page, so in original language, and then on the other side they would have um, a translation or interpretation, and and so those were um, very very successful series, as I recall, um, the history of philosophy, and then um, of course before I got there and and continuing through today, regional history has always been uh, one of the areas that the the press published. Um, Robert Creeble, a local historian to Lafayette. Um, published several books with the, the university, with Purdue Press, um, about um, um, local uh, figures of local interest. Um, we published right before I got there, but it was a very popular book the whole time I was there, uh, Bob Topping, Century and Beyond, which was a history of uh, the first 100 years of Purdue. Um, I was the editor for a book uh, by an author by the name of John Hanau, and the name of the book was Around Indiana, Round Barns in the Hoosier State. And that was a very interesting book. It had, uh, it was all black and white, but uh, um, trying to provide a photographic history of every round barn that had ever been built in Indiana, including ones that had no long, were no longer standing. So we had historical photos and current photos in that. 
So um, quite a few uh, books of local interest, too. Yeah, that's very nice, though. And you, you don't see very many of those. No. They were always very well received, though, oh, sure. you know, because, of course, we were a scholarly press um, publishing things like literary criticism and philosophy. But then to have the regional history, it, it um, perhaps introduced Purdue Press to to people who would not have come right, into contact exactly. with it otherwise. A little different audience. Exactly. Uh -huh. yes. Right, yeah. Do you want to make any comment on the editorial board? or? or that? I was not involved okay. in the editorial board. Okay. I, I uh, understood how it worked. Um, manuscripts came in, they were reviewed, projects were um, carefully considered, and when the ones were identified, they would go to the editorial board, and, and then, the, of course, those uh, board members would have a final say in whether the books mm. got published. They, were they also sent up a review or for peer review? Did they? They were. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. They were quite heavily reviewed. I'd have to say, um, in my recollection, again, I wasn't largely sure. involved in that side of the press. Right. So okay. I yeah. normally was picking up on the books when they were, um, well, for quite a long time after I wasn't an editor any longer. I was picking up on them when they were through the editorial process sure. and ready to start for production. Yeah. So. How about the book jackets? Uh, you had designers that were involved in that. We yeah. did a lot of for many years because we were a part of the Office of Publications, and I guess I haven't really spoken about yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to ask. You. Um, when I joined the press, we were part of the Office of Publications, uh, which was under the umbrella of University Relations um, at the university. Um, Bill Whalen was the director of the press and of the Office of Publications, and. Um, um, Losing my train of thought here. The publications you're talking about, uh, how the office and then the split to the press, or thank you, sorry. Um, uh, so Bill was the the director when he retired. There was a decision made to um, reassign the press on campus to become a part of the library system, and so at that point it joined the Purdue libraries. The other decision uh, that was that really affected the, the history of the press at that time was to establish a full-time director. Bill this had been 1990? This or? was in, no, this oh. would have been when Bill Whalen retired in 1992. Okay. The both things happened at the same time. Okay. And um, basically after, since Bill had been a part-time director since he was, uh, he was uh, the director of Office of Publications, director of the Purdue Press, and then he also had uh, an appointment as a professor of journalism. He, uh, when he retired, the decision was made to get us a full-time director, and at that time uh, to move us to the library system, and part of that was also um, at, in order to join um, the Association of American University Presses, which uh, was the mem was the member organization for our for all university presses, um, we needed a full time director to do that. Okay, you had so not been a member before. We no? had not been. I think we had been something like an affiliate member, perhaps. A lot of organizations do have similar things like. That. I think we had had some association with them, but we became a full member once we had a full-time director, and uh, that would have happened uh, when David Sanders joined us okay. in 1992. Okay. So. Um, I was going to, one thing I wanted to ask about uh, the Office of Publications, there was also the uh, uh, university periodicals, that was a, a unit under that. Right? That was within the Office of Publications, sure. so they published. And those uh, would have been periodicals, it's like campus copy or Monday memo or inside well Purdue? Um, yes inside Purdue um, Purdue Pur perspective sure. was one of their large publications they were also doing a variety Office of publications was uh, was the arm of the university that prepared all sorts of publications for uh, across campus sure. um, brochures promotional recruiting um, university catalogs that sort of thing sure. they w they had responsibility for all that and periodicals was one section of Office of Publications. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, any, any, any of your notes? Um, I, in looking through my notes, I just prepared a few um, crucial dates. I things that I recall uh, during my tenure. And uh, for example, when I joined in 1990, um, all of the production was being done conventionally, which meant uh, that you needed a typesetter and. Um, uh, typesetting machine, it would run out. Uh, it was basically camera-ready copy is what they called it. 
and they would run out on long sheets and the designers in order to lay out the pages would have to have boards and they cut the page to fit. Um, they have boards with marking to show how long the page length should be and basically everything was done by hand cutting up the paper, the, the camera ready paper and waxing it into place. Um, when I joined the press, uh, the comp desktop computers were new to the industry, um, brand new. In fact, our first computers that we were using to do layout were had maybe eight inch screens. They were tiny. They were tiny, very small like computers, very small computers, <coughs> a very small amount of memory, <laughs> as I recall. And uh, but that was new to us um, to convert our workflow to a digital workflow. And we were actually an early adopter of that, and it made a lot of sense because it saved us a lot of money um, and improved our workflow. So at that point in 1990, I began uh, converting all of the, the workflow to digital, which basically meant that we used desktop computers to do our page layout. Um, obviously, that's the way things are still done now, but back then it was quite cutting edge. So. Um, from 1990 to 1992, we went from doing most of our books conventional to finally, probably by 91 or 92, being completely digital um, and not doing any conventional typesetting anymore. Um, during that time, we also started using acid-free paper as our um, exclusive tech stock in books. What, was, what prompted that, do you think? Um, to to keep the books from deteriorating, okay. to give them more longevity so you were really on the shelf. Really looking at a preservation. Yes, we were. We were thinking in terms of how long the book would last, because obviously the older books you start to see the age and the wearing and the and the paper wearing out, and and so this was the an binding effort. and things of that sort. Exactly, and by using the acid-free materials, we were hoping to. Uh, we were thinking conservation-mindedly. Mm -hmm. So, um, I already mentioned in 1990, Verna Emery Poetry Competition was established. Uh, let's see. Did she come for some of the uh, awards? Did she, did she come for the, uh, when the award was given? I don't know how the award ceremony was handled okay. in there. I, she wasn't I sure. remember, again, I, uh, I was very much involved in the production of the book. Sure. Um, 1992, Bill Whalen retiring, and again, he was the original director of the of the press um, from 93, between 93 and 94 we switched to from university relations to the library. Um, in 92 David Sanders became the first full-time director of the press and shortly after his arrival I'll say probably by 93 we had joined the Association of American University Presses. Um, somewhere around 97 to 98, we hired our first sales representative, which was somebody who actually would go in, out and promote our books to bookstores. Um, we had always used distributors like Baker and Taylor or Ingram to, to distribute our books, but then that, again, gave us another way to get our books into the what market. Was the, do you know, I mean, what was the out outcome of that result? It seemed to help a little bit? Yes, we noticed yeah. a difference. We noticed a difference and, and would represent us at shows, trade shows and such. So, um, uh, good promotion for the press. Um, in, around 1996, as my memory goes, um, we started using print-on-demand services and, and basically that was another innovation for our uh, production side of things. Um, of course, as costs became tight. Uh, it was always an effort. Do you, do you reprint a book? Will it sell another 500 to 1,000 copies or will it, do we really only need another 100? And, um, and so for the books that still had a market but maybe had gone past their original uh, higher sales, um, we started doing print on demand, which uh, basically in the early days was high-end photocopying. It, it of course has evolved and, and is still in use today and, and yeah. is very nice quality, um, but it would allow us to print fewer copies of the book and keep the book in print for those people who still wanted um, access to it. Um, in uh, Probably around 1997, there was a trend in the book industry to uh, move towards electronic books. Um, the press worked very hard at that time to create electronic copies of their books. Um, the industry itself didn't really take off at that point. The electronic books were not widely adopted and, and they were available, but back then people didn't want to sit and read their books on a computer screen. 
And of course, now we're at a new age, and um, electronic books are becoming very popular now. They, the, it's, it's almost as if the technology has made it more comfortable for the reader, and so, um, so I'm sure that's something that that is still playing into the press. Uh, but it, we did try er, early on, as did many publishers, and and I did have to say, overall, the the um, the market wasn't there yet for it. Um, and then um, from, uh, from 1998 to probably around 2001, I remember that there were several new series created. There was the i Business Books and Notabelle Books and the Founders Series, things like that. So um, the press has continued to grow uh, with more series and adding journals since I left. But They didn't have many journals when you were there? Or? I don't remember any journals. There may have been one by the time I left. Okay. Um, now they have some other stuff. Now they have several, it appears. Sure. But yes, no, when I was there, journals were not, uh, did not figure strongly into what we did. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, you, you talked about the directors, but just did, um, so it was Waylon and then Sanders mm -hmm. and then Margaret Hunt would have been the interim. Yes, she was. Uh, 95, 97, and then Tom Bacher came in 97 and left in 2008. Okay, yes. Right. Yes. Um, any other uh, things that we missed on the, uh, the press that you'd like to share with us? Um, One thing that is probably important to note is when I started with the press, again, using conventional techniques, uh, we were printing six books in 1990. I believe five or six was our list that year. And by the time I left in 2002, we were publishing appro approximately 35 books a year with the same staff. So uh, you can tell how digital uh, publishing uh, really changed what we could do. Sure. Um, it really increased our workflow um, and uh, made things faster and and uh, gave us a chance to put more material out to, to accept more projects right. and, and to, to publish more. What about more. any contacts with the other university presses in the state? There's I, whether uh, IU has a... IU is... In the Big Ten, we were the smallest university press, and, and they were the biggest. They uh, had a very strong uh, publishing. Illinois was pretty good size. They, they? Are, they were. They oh, were. Okay. With the, the Purdue University Press was a very small press when I was there. We were growing, but sure. they were a very small press. Sure. and. Um, uh, our contact with other university presses came through annual meetings that we would have. I remember attending several production managers meetings um, at various parts in the state and, and that was the point where you could interact um, with your colleagues from peer institutions. Uh, you could share information and, right. and those I always found those to be very useful oh, conferences. Yeah, I would think so. And then you also interacted with the vendors because of course they would be there to sure. to promote their services. So um, does uh, Notre Dame and do the other schools and the universities have presses? I'm not aware of Notre Dame having one. IU is the one that quickly comes to mind. I wonder if I'm not State does. Uh, I, don't I have never heard of it, let me put it that way. I don't know that they don't have one. Um, but IU was the one that I, I strongly remember. Sure. And then were you involved at all? Who would put the catalogs together that you'd send? Um, we all had, because we were a small press, there were, <laughs> we, we all wore many hats. Sure. Um, I was obviously involved with that from a marketing standpoint, sure. but I remember all of us having a hand in that. Um, uh, putting the books in there, the, writing the copy for it, editing or proofreading sure. or what have you. So. Um, we'd put a catalog together once a year. Um, at one time, it might have been twice a year. I remember. Trying to remember. I fall I and spring. I used, to get, I used to get them in the archives, and of course, one copy always came to the archives, special collections. Yes, mm -hmm. and that was true of all of our production. We had set lists. Once the books were finished, um, we would distribute the books according to our set lists, and the Purdue Library always got a copy sure. for their archive. We, al we also always sent copies to the Library of Congress. Um, to be archived, right. so um, that was always uh, get it on their catalog. That was a standard. Uh, a standard Distri happening. That's on your distribution. <laughs> standard distribution, <laughs> exactly. Uh, what about uh, then? You, um, I was going to ask you about your current position. You, then you left the press. Is that when you went to A Communication? Actually, no. Oh. I uh, took a detour and I uh, became a freelance editor, uh, working for myself for the six years following the time I left the press. 
and actually here in town. Here in town. Okay. And most of the work I did was for clients at Purdue. And interestingly enough, I edited several Purdue Press books during that time. Um, people who uh, were referred to me and knew of my connection with the press, and and so I I actually was the editor for. Um, uh, the Grand Old Man, uh, the, the biography of uh, William Carroll Latta, and, who was uh, instrumental in the Purdue Ag School. And, and then Fred Whitford the, wrote it, and he used a lot of the materials that we had up in the archives. Okay, and that, yes, Fred was the author, and then Fred was also the author for the book on Virginia Meredith, um, and I edited that one as well. Very nice. So, and I actually also worked with uh, Purdue Studies in Romance Literatures, um, and did some limited work for them as well okay. on a couple of their books. And then when did you come back to Purdue? Um, I came back to the university in December of 2007. Okay. Yes, December okay. of 2007. I rejoined the Ag Communication Service, um, drew heavily on my production skills, uh, and was working with a program to create electronic field trips for kids in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, but eventually switched within the department to a different position, and um, I am now an editor for the, the um, College of Agriculture again through the Ag Communication oh, Service. Very good. Okay. What about family? Family? Yes. <laughs> um, you're being local here, and, uh, you, local. and you're married? And you're married? I am. Family is what kept me local. I, um, my, husband of, uh, my husband and I just celebrated our... 28th anniversary, and we have two boys, an 18-year-old and a 13-year-old. Is, is the 18 still in high school or is he in college? Finishing high school. Is he going to come to Purdue? Um, he, doesn't probably, he doesn't know where he's going yet. That's yeah, okay. And the seventh grader is too young to think about college yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about any hobbies or special interests? You got any particular hobbies you'd like to share with us? Reading is always one, Super. of course. Yeah. Um, I love, and I, I actually enjoy just keeping up with the, the technological developments as they affect books. Um, that's. Do you read any e-books? I have. Okay. I have, actually. I have uh, an iPod, and uh, it has the ability to download and, and read books. And I've taken advantage of some of the, I, I love classics, so I've taken advantage of some of the, the books that are um, in the public domain and have read several books that way and, and surprised myself. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I really liked it. So, oh, oh, a couple things in closing. Do you have a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us? And also I thought I'd ask you about an outstanding event. Um, wow. Uh, Purdue tradition. Do you go to any of the athletics? I'm things? not. I'm, I... I I am a sideline fan of Purdue through my husband and my son. I can't say that I'm the active one, but I certainly always you cheer for Purdue. There you go. I, boiler I, up. I, boiler up. And uh, as far as activities, I, I have a lot of very good memories. I've been associated with the university now. Um, since 1987, so uh, a lot of good memories over the years. Um, probably my strongest memories are of the colleagues that I've worked with over the years. Uh, some very fine people uh, as part of the university right. uh, that I have and a you lot kept of respect in for. And you kept in touch and met, and met I over have. time. I have, yes. That's yeah. very good. Yeah. Uh, any, uh, I'll leave to you in closing any topics that I forgot to ask you or anything that you'd like to say in summary? Um, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I think those. Um, this has been very, very good, and I thank you very much. Thank You're you, very Carol. welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Ah. Additional things uh, about uh, that. Carol's going to make some comments about Margaret Hunt, who served as the interim director on a couple of occasions in between the directors, and she since has since passed away. But she's going to make a couple comments. Um, I'd just like to mention that um, Margaret Hunt was the managing editor when I joined the press in 1990 and was still there in that capacity when I left in 2002 and remained there for, for a number of years past my tenure with the press. Um, she was an incredible asset to the press. Um, she was the, the person who did most of the interaction with the authors, um, with uh, uh, preparing the manuscripts um, 
for the editorial board review, for the peer review, um, for tracking where any one project was at any one time um, editorially, and and um, was just a, a a wonderful, wonderful resource for the press in terms of her abilities with languages, in terms of her editorial abilities. Um, she was a mentor to me and uh, uh, obviously a long-term employee at the press and, and uh, her influence is seen throughout the works that the press has published over the years. That's very nice. Thank you very much, Thank Carol. you. Thank you. <clears throat>